William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. The odd thing about a killer, folks, you'd never believe it if his gun wasn't showing. The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Barry Craig speaking. The big gripe with a confidential investigator is that he has no confidential life of his own. You're on call day or night. Some jokers found your pedigree in a Manhattan telephone directory. There's a missing uncle wandered off his nuts, a double-crossing partner wandered off with the cash register, or a tomb relic sure to set off a tongue war if you don't recover same look at his split. Oh, carve out five minutes of privacy for yourself and bet on it. Someone's at your elbow asking for a bite. The case in point began a night or so ago in a barber shop. Tony's tonsorial power, the gold leaf on the window red. It was my next. One more customer move, and I'd stop looking like an unemployed violinist. But I never got to sit in Tony's barber chair. Fate popped into Tony's open doorway to beckon me out of the joint. You there. Craig. Fate was a guy in baggy pants chewing an unlighted cigar. Marty Walensky, a hack driver. Hey, Craig. If you've never been shortchanged by Walensky, you haven't lived. I dragged myself over to Walensky. What's on your fat little mind? That your jalopy outside, Craig? The dark green job? Yeah, across the street. Why? I thought it looked like your load. You got a dame in it, waiting for you. A dame? Walensky, what kind of a gag she are you... She flagged me at 78 and 3rd. So I know a good, reliable charmer, she asked. So here we are. I keep an office. We've been there. Now we're here. She's waiting in your jalopy. You don't want the business? Oh, I haven't seen the back of my neck for six weeks. It's my neck. On you, the long hair looks good. Listen, Craig, you can't wait. Whatever's with this chick can't wait. As a matter of fact, confidentially, she didn't even stop the dress before flagging me down. Walensky wasn't too inaccurate about the lady's get-up or lack of it. Hair pinned up high like she just left off washing her ears. A mink wrap over a nightgown that flapped over satin bedroom slippers. And fear. Fear and neon lights all over a pretty face. I'm Barry Craig, miss. I'm Peggy Palmer. Well, what's it about? Not here. Drive somewhere quickly. But just an idea. There isn't time. I, I have a feeling I've been followed. Oh, please start your car. Look, miss. This isn't a public hack. And before I get involved, I want to know what... Oh! Somebody's rifle happy. You hurt, miss? No. You? How does the side of my jaw look under glass? You're bleeding. Flying glass has that effect on me. I start to gush. Pull away, please, Mr. Craig, before we're murdered. While I kept busy with incidental washing and cauterizing, a frightened lady in mink gave me the facts. A bite at a time. I live with my brother, George. And no love lost? No love? I'm counting the scratches on your beautiful neck. Oh, my brother fought to keep me from leaving the house. Uh, George Palmer, you've heard of me? Have I? Oh, yes, I have. A Sunday picture story in the tabloids. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, help me with this adhesive. Uh, Oh, thanks. A freak get rich on, wasn't it? Uh, he found oil in his backyard or something? He found a diary believed to be George Washington in the works of an antique wall clock. Pardon my error. A clock he put in a rubbish shop on 3rd Avenue. It should happen to me. So what's the problem? The diary's the problem. Why so? It's valuable. So cheers. No. Since the diary, our home's been a madhouse. Claimants and cranks. People looking to buy it. People looking to steal it. Uh... The usual backwash to a Klondike. Yes, all those things you say. What seemed to be a stroke of good fortune has become a nightmare. Does Brother George want to sell the diary? Very much, but for an enormous price. Enormous, like... Uh... $100,000. Wow, a lot of cabbage. Any nibbles? 
One collector, a Grant Tyler, telephoned to say he might pay that much if he could examine the diary. Authenticate it. What? My brother wants the money in hand, in cash, first. I see. The window glass on my jalopy, uh, who do I bill for it? I, I don't know. Brother George? Perhaps. Uh, for anybody, Mr. Craig. Anybody? You said claimants and cranks. The usual backwash. <laughs> How right you are. Anonymous phone calls. Notes and weird hieroglyphics slipped under the door. Bricks hurled from the street. <laughs> Broken window glass. We've got more of it than anybody, Mr. Craig. Just come home with me and see. Come on to my house, huh? Just what job do you have in mind for me? Take charge of the diary. Negotiate its sale to this Mr. Tyler or, or somebody. And how do I wrestle a diary free from Brother George? You won't have to. I have the diary here with me. Hmm? I took it secretly from George's vault. <laughs> hundred grand sometimes doesn't look it. I was leafing through an old battered notebook. Blow on it, and it would shred into yellow confetti. Valley Forge and Bunker Hill. I could make out some of the date lines and references. Mostly personal stuff, it looks like. The founding father's beast at the end of the day. Good cheer. Yes, that's what makes the diary so valuable. It isn't a history of the revolution. It's the story of the people around him through personal relationships. I say turn it over to a museum. What? <laughs> Do that and turn your brother over to an asylum, huh? Negotiate it, Sale, please. End this terror. What's your phone number? My phone number? To negotiate anything, I'll need your brother's consent. But, uh, The way it stands now, beautiful, you stole the diary and I'm compounding a theft. Well, don't fret. I'll talk to him like a Dutch uncle. Foresight 2, 1643. Foresight 2, 1643. Hello? Hello, George Palmer? Yes, this is George Palmer. This is Barry Craig. The detective? Confidential investigator. Now, uh, try not to blow a fuse. Your sister Peggy's with me. Keep her. Generous of you, but my harem's overcrowded as it is. She's a little unnerved uh, over that diary. I want you to authorize me to negotiate the sale of the diary. The biggest buck possible, and I don't want a cent. No. Try being reasonable, Palmer, or all the diary will get you is a diamond-studded straitjacket. You can go to... Palmer. Great. Palmer, what's happening? I'm going to be murdered. Something happened to my brother. You just inherited a George Washington diary. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's go pay our last respects. <laughs> George Palmer lay flat on his back. His eyes were open and calm. <laughs> As if now that he was dead, the furies had left him. Two bullets fired close to the head. The diary has been here. Take that to it. Don't borrow guilt, Peggy. Your departure with the diary had nothing to do with nothing. Your brother was chilled first, then came the search. Keep puffing those eyes, and you'll need a seeing-eyed dog to lead you around. I, I can't help feeling miserable. No. You had a brother, and now you haven't. It's something to get used to. Dead. And only an hour ago. He was clawing at your throat. It's a bereavement, sure, and I don't want to be unsentimental. Ask your question. Is this that antique wall clock your brother found the diary in? Yes. I worry about myself on rickety chairs, but that's the only way to see the inside of this clock. Hmm. Clock's older than thin, that's for sure. In good running order? Why, yes, I believe so. He, uh... Sales receipt for the clock. Do you have it? Yes, sir. George kept it here. In his desk. A wall clock in running condition. $25. Sold to George Palmer. Company? Got any idea who? No. I'll play butler. Who is it? Telegram from Miss Palmer. Let's have... Halloween was last week, mister. Your hands raised, please. Thank you. You too, Miss Palmer? I've been stuck up by a lot of guys, all kinds and shapes. But this one was in a class all by himself. Short and petite. 
A waxed mustache with a comical full man shoe slant at the end. White gloves and a moth eaten formal tuxedo, two sizes too big for him. The gat he was holding was something else for the book. Percussion flintlock. An antique type you only see in a museum case where the card reads, Relic of the War of the State. I watched him sniff around the room a little and then come back to us. The George Washington Diary. You will please give it to me, Miss Palmer. The, the diary? He hasn't got it, friend. No? Back up two feet and say hello to a stiff. Uh, he? he? Is George Palmer? Was. Oh, dear. Whoever gave him those twin preparations of the skull took off with the diary. Is, is the truth, Miss Palmer? I, I, yes, it, it, it's the truth, of course. <laughs> of course not. The lie sticks in your throat. It's only a prominent Adam's apple. Give her a complex about that and you'll the find... The George Washington diary. Give it to me. If you give you what we haven't got, we'd have to be magicians. <laughs> Even to live, you'd have to be magicians. So, it comes down to that. You have one minute. That uh, hunk of museum cast iron that can do the work of a gun? You see. Yeah, boom, boom, and where did the world suddenly go? <laughs> Funny thing, I, I can't wait to see. I'm that curious. Curious? Uh-huh. I know about guns. Times get tough in my business. I can be a gunsmith. If I live, I... It is idiotic quibbling. I'm coming to a decision. My hunch is that what it takes to load that museum piece isn't around anymore. Nobody manufactures it. Nobody sells it. The minute is gone. My hunch is that you're bluffing, friend, applying the old psychological squeeze. What if I just begin moving? Hey, you'll be shot. Barry, don't. Don't bury me on the side of a hill, beautiful. I hate sleeping lopsided. Please, nothing foolish, nothing heroic. Give him the diary. My life's against it, beautiful. Give it to a runt in white gloves and a baggy tuxedo, I'd have to disown myself. I'm coming over, no, friend. No, stop. Stop, you fool. I'll shoot. I'll shoot. Let me go. Sure. When you're out, look on life, get a little more. I'm like, whoa. Smallest man in the world can be the most tenacious. This one fell apart in slow motion. Before giving up, his thumb gouged my eye a little and his teeth made a meal of my arm. Before coming to, we had to throw him into a bathtub of water. He was out as cold as that. Uh, keep an eye on him, beautiful. Besides, I've only can wash down the drain pipe. The answers finally wrung out of him still add up to the zaniest of my experiences. I'm even caught me bellows. Before. As long as a name can get. My great grandfather was the Stephen Courtney Bellows, intelligence captain in the army of, of the Rev. Scripps. His underage. <laughs> he was accused of spying for the British. I unjustly, Mr. Craig. It's an infamous slur against a great man. Rough. Even now, I have a petition before the President of the United States demanding that he restore the good name of my great ancestor. Which brings you to the diary? Yes, I, I wanted to examine it. Mm -hmm. If George Washington wrote things that reflect well of my great ancestor, I want this information shouted from the rooftop. And if General Washington call your great ancestor a skunk? Then the diary must be suppressed. The infamous lie must not be repeated. It must not. Cut it. One question, Bellows. Yes? What lunatic asylum do you call home? Harbor Heights. Mm. Uh, but I was detained there unjustly. It, it was all part of an infamous... <laughs> An escaped lunatic in a monkey suit, armed with an old dueling pistol. <laughs> About the pistol, it turned out my hunch was cockeyed. It was loaded. You could have been killed. If the gun didn't backfire. But I can't understand. Why didn't he shoot? His reflexes wouldn't reflex. <laughs> he was so hoodoo at watching me behave like a suicide... He couldn't get up the coordination it took to blast away. Oh, I'm glad he couldn't. So glad. Are you so glad? Yes. You say that like... You know something? What, Barry? Keep twinkling those eyes at me and I'll climb right up on that white cloud with you. And, Barry? Go sailing over the moon. Oh, I love sailing over the moon. A 
little later, over ham steaks and coffee in the Midtown Hofbrau, Peggy and I batted the case around with Lieutenant Trav Rogers. Just a few more facts, Craig. That is, if you can spare them. Well, uh, you know about all there is. I know you gave me exclusive custody of a corpse and a lunatic. Show more respect, Trav. Fellow's great grandfather. I've already had the pedigree up to my ears. I want the diary, Craig. Who does it? You'll have to get on the end of a long line. You uh, won't surrender it? By court order? By police request. No can do. And our reason? It's the property of my client here, sacred to my keeping. I ask your reason. State. Diary is the honey that draws the flies. While I've got it, it's open season on Barry Craig. Someone may come calling with a gun, and voila, I'll catch me a murderer. Or catch a bullet. All right. Your life. Squander it any way you like. Good night, Miss Palmer. Good night, Lieutenant. With the good lieutenant off, muttering to himself, and Peggy off, tending to whatever it is girls tend to, I made like a negotiator. Grant Tyler, a guy with $100,000 worth of interest in an old notebook. Was a guy well worth cultivating. Hello? Hello. I want to talk to Grant Tyler. This is Grant Tyler. Barry Craig, uh, representing the Palmers. Yes, Mr. Craig. That cash offer of 100000 for the George Washington diary, does it still hold good? It does, providing, of course, that I can first examine the diary. I'll bring it right over. If you like. What's the shortest route to your place? There's traffic light. I've got it. Be seeing you, Tyler. The second traffic light passed Forest Park. I got the stop signal, a hand signal. A guy in a blue uniform, a traffic cop, or a fireman, or a parcel delivery messenger. In the dark, he looked like all three of them. You were going 60, pal. The gas pedal jammed. Are you a traffic cop? No. No? Then what the... Uh-uh, don't get impolite, pal. No. I'd be a dope to. So it's a stick-up. Surprise. Forty bucks is all I've got. You'll never make Bermuda. Keep your wallet in your pocket. Now drive into the park. All I want is your company. Into the park, pal. <laughs> a look at the uniform, and I knew it. A four-dollar rental in any theatrical costume shop. I'd been suckered. Our destination in the park was a shadowy side road. On the green, Buster got down to Casey's. Let's have it, pal. It? The George Washington diary. Oh, you know about it. Hand it over. Just like that, huh? Cigarettes? Darling can't do you no good. Can I help it if I'm a dedicated chain smoker? Oh, matches. I'm out of them. You, Buster? Uh, here. Thanks. Ah. I can face the future now. Give me the diary. Or do you still want to clown around? No, no, the diary. Here it is. From me to you, without love. Uh, who are you working for, Buster? Two kids and a blind grandmother. Mind if I borrow your car? Help yourself. Thanks, sport. Now, turn around. Must you? It's a compulsion with me, pal. I'll cash in this diary and go get analyzed. Promise? My word of honor. <laughs> it took a long time for the balloon to drift down from out of gravity and settle back on my shoulders. When I was finally used to owning a head again, I had a cab drop me at Tyler's. I'd meet up with the baloney cop again if the cover of his matchbox I'd connived was any help. Moriarty's Bar and Grill, the cover said. I'd be haunting the place. Yes? Barry Craig. Oh, you're late. Sorry, I was detained. Well, we'll have to do this another night, Craig. I've no time left for you now. Tough. Can I come in a minute? Well, I see no point in... Thought you were an Americana collector crazy to buy the diary. I am, but, uh... But I haven't got it to sell, and you know I haven't got it. 
That's why the brush now? You're speaking nonsense. Am I? I was detained, I said, by a hood who stuck me up with a diary. I know nothing about it. Then what do you know? Talk and act responsibly, Tyler. George Palmer was murdered earlier tonight. George Palmer was murdered? If you didn't know it, talk to me, Tyler. Well, after your telephone call, Mr. Holland telephoned me. The junk dealer who sold Palmer the antique wall clock? Yes. Holland said he'd have the diary for me, and could he come over right away, tonight? And you said yes? Well, I'd be a fool not to. Holland's price is only 10000 And 10 years for receiving stolen goods? Holland claims to be the rightful owner, that he merely sold Palmer a clock. Even so, you'd still buy a lawsuit? That's much of a risk I'm willing to take. Holland's engaged lawyers offer to guarantee me against loss. Holland's due here tonight, you say? Any minute now. You'd you better go. No, I'd better stay where I can listen and not be seen. Oh, hear me. Park behind the drapes, but Mr. Craig. You lose the argument, Tyler, so don't argue, huh? I got an earful. Holland looked and sounded like a guy ready, willing, and able to set fire to his junk shop and to himself. You don't have the diary, Mr. Holland? No, I came to tell you no. But you assured me. Something went wrong. But give me one day, Mr. Tyler. One day and I will get you that diary. One day and I will finish the transaction, I promise. I only have to get my hands on a no-good double-crossing rat. A no-good double-crossing rat. Oh, my friend in the park. Buster's been working for Holland until he branched out for himself. Moriarty's bar and grill was a sewer joint. Open a manhole and drop in. Twenty minutes in it and Peggy was gasping for air. Oh, I can't stand much more of this place, Barry. You won't have to. Surprise. You see him? He sees me. And making like to come over yet. Wait, the, the girl. Hi, pal. The name's Barry Craig. I'll sit with the law. <laughs> I just figured out how you got to Moriarty's. Did you? Yeah. A cute gimmick, conning me out of that matchbox. Your car key. Car's parked on a corner. Thanks for the loan. Don't mention it. Oh, I almost forgot. Uh, the diary. You'll be wanting that back. Yeah. A change of heart? Yeah. I'm a regular Jekyll and Hyde. Half of me wants to go straight, the other half gets out of line. Sad. How worthless did you find the diary to be? Hey, you're smart, Craig. Smarter than one guy's got a right to be. You approached Grant Tyler with the diary? Yeah, I approached Tyler. He checked it through with a spyglass, page by page, and then threw it back at me. It wasn't worth a plug nickel, he said. The diary isn't worth... Don't take it so hard, lady. You got the diary in a grab bag. But my brother... Oh, yeah. That. What about that, Buster? You can't pin it on me. No? I'm for hire, but I'm not a torpedo or a fall guy. Whoever murdered Palmer wasn't me. Uh, can I go now? No. For coming clean like I have? You give me a break. Make out like we never met. No. So ahead, huh? Yeah, I'm the compulsive type. But I'll go get analyzed after I even up the score. Buster nursing his jaw in the pie wagon, I went cruising with a beautiful lady. Uptown, cross town, downtown, watching the lights go out. Dawn is coming up. Yeah, for me too. For you too, Barry? Dawn. You get drugged by night, you can't see a foot ahead of you. You're too busy listening to the thump of your heart. Especially with a beautiful babe blowing stardust at you. <laughs> Barry, you're talking all mixed up. I'm always confused before I'm clear. That wall clock was sold in running order. Holland's sales receipt guaranteed running order. Oh? Your mind's on the case? On a corpse. The clock couldn't be in running order, not with a notebook hidden in the woods. But now you're contradicting. Stay with me, baby. When I examined the clock, it wasn't running. The mechanism had been injured. It wasn't running. Yet it was when Holland sold it to your brother. Does that mean something? It means that someone planted the diary in the clock after George Palmer carried it home from Holland. Am I clear? 
No, not me. A phony diary not worth its weight in paper sets off a chain reaction of cranks, connivers, and grabbers. <laughs> Everybody went for the gag. George, too? It cost him his life? Yeah, George, too. The question I'm asking is, who could or would plant a worthless diary in a wall clock? Who could or would? Only somebody who wanted George Palmer murdered. But not for the diary. How long was your brother dead before I called him up? Darren, well, you're out of your mind. You heard George shot. I was with you when you did. Don't bang too hard on the alibi, beautiful. I heard somebody shot, but it didn't have to be George. Anybody could have called himself George Palmer with me, especially over the telephone. Anybody. Or, say, uh, Grant Kyler. Staging a phony murder so you could blow stardust in my eye. Make me your iron alibi. We're... We're stopping? End of the road, beautiful. Police headquarters. I don't suppose you want to tell me your motive. <laughs> Insurance, I guess it to be. You're the lucky beneficiary. Those nights riding a white cloud, beautiful. You and I will never see them again. Yeah, dawn's really come up. It's broad daylight now. <laughs> Good night, folks. See you next week. been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, Dead on Arrival, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story of murder in wax, about which Barry Craig has this to say. Next week, I meet a wandering parrot screaming bloody murder sculptor with an amazing knack for making the dead lifelike, and a hired killer who sticks closer to me than my socks, the three put together, spell murder. See you next week, folks. Featured in the role of Peggy was Arlene Blackburn, Barry Craig, starring William Gargan was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is Don Bartle speaking. Now it's Meredith Wilson's Music Room on NBC.